The first time I saw Peter Coffey speak was probably, it feels like about four or five years ago. And it was at a time where, where Salesforce was kind of making this, starting to make this leap. Are you a CRM company? Are you Force.com? Well, like, what are you guys? What is, and as a partner, I was uncertain as to whether or not there was, there was, I had a feeling for where I thought Salesforce was going to go, but it, was, it seemed incongruent. Peter went up on stage and basically turned that whole, my whole perception of where that business was going upside down. And I remember coming back after that Dreamforce to the team and just saying, guys, like, we are no longer in the CRM business. We're in the change business. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Peter Coffey in charge of strategy and research for Salesforce.com. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. I bring you greetings from the mad genius. I'm sure that if Mark Benioff were here, he would be the first to point out that this group is somewhat larger than the first Dreamforce, and he would throw down a mandate to all of you to grow your community at a rate that makes it necessary for you to declare a sellout because the cities just can't hold an event any larger. You've got a room for 18,000 here, so I, I, I hope you, you know, put down your dates for a, a little while in advance. The, um, Word adaptive brings to mind where I was when I got my phone call, to borrow, to borrow a phrase from uh, our opening. Um, I got a call 13 years ago from Mark Benioff. I'd known him when he was in a previous career. And he said, I'm going to be in town for uh, the day next week. Do you have time for breakfast? And we got together. And that was when he said, our customers are pulling us away from being a vendor of a product a CRM sold as a subscription model, software as a service, which was perceived as disruptive at the time. And he said, our customers are demanding that we make it more integratable, more configurable, more capable of realizing their vision for what they want and not merely being a great way of consuming our vision of what CRM could be. And that was 13 years ago. And 10 years ago, I got another call saying, we believe that we've checked the boxes. We think we're ready to deliver what would be a platform. A platform, by my definition, is that which is used to do things that you didn't know it could be made to do. It is not merely that it is a highly configurable product. It is an, a creative medium in which people are now realizing amazing visions. And I hope that all of you have one of those, have a vision. The word adaptive, which is the main theme for today, always brings to my mind um, some of the work that has been done by Tom Peters, who in particular pointed out that the word chaos is too often used as a bad thing. Chaos is almost always described as confusion, disorder, unpredictability, as if those were bad things. But he made the point that there's another really important definition of that word, which is the formless matter out of which a universe comes. That is where we are now if you look at it. It is not that there is disorder, it is that there is opportunity to take an amazing set of resources, of connectivity, of collaborative access, of the ability to start a new company, as Greg was just saying, by finding the right partners and quickly putting your cinnamon on the latte to make it a unique vision of what that can be. And the next thing you know, a very asset light organization has become a verb. And Tom uh, wrote a book in 87 called Thriving on Chaos, and he made two points. Number one, he apologized for all the money he and Bob Waterman made two years before that with In Search of Excellence. I don't believe he gave the money back, but he did observe that when they back and went back and looked a few years later at their so-called excellent companies, the ones that had adhered most closely to the definitions of excellence that had been set forth at that time were the ones that were doing the worst. They had failed to adapt. And that was when Tom began to say, it is not that you thrive in spite of chaos, it is not that you thrive in defense against chaos, it is that you take the chaos as opportunity and that you turn it into the environment in which you can be a leader. And from then on, he said, maybe two, different dozen, two dozen different ways Adaptability is the new excellence, or even adaptability is the only sustainable excellence. Anything else, anything else calcifies you into a model of what was good today. And the minute you start to think that that is going to be the thing that's good forever, you've already begun to die. It's a post-dated suicide note. 
Let's talk about surfing on the chaos. Tom used the expressions uh, systems for a world turned upside down. It's interesting what happens when you take the map of the world and put north at the bottom. All of a sudden you realize that the Pacific Rim is a really amazing marketplace. I've been telling my sons who are now grown ever since they could look at a globe. You don't live on the west coast of the United States. You live on the east coast of the Pacific Rim. That is the marketplace in which the growth will happen, in which the competitors will emerge, in which the collaborators will be found. And he talked about some specific prescriptions of measurement, of control, of decentralization and goals and integrity. And I'd like to talk about some examples that have not necessarily done all of those things, but, but do illustrate their power. For example, decentralization of information and authority. I guarantee you this is not an example you ever expected to see me use. One of the most interesting organizations in human history is a little band called the Grateful Dead, who have been profiled in any number of management journals for their remarkable leadership in identifying and treating their best customers as VIP co-creators, inviting fans at concerts to record them and distribute the bootleg tapes. Why? Because that constantly put new pressure on them always to do something new. Every concert was just the vehicle you use to build demand for the next one, as opposed to the old model of professional musicians desperately curating their content. So as Tommy Lee Jones said in the, uh, in the first Men in Black movie, darn, I'm going to have to buy the White Album again. And turning that same content into, an, into a revenue stream? No. They were always, always putting the pressure on themselves to do something that built on their reputation instead of just trying to live off of it. There's another organization you may know that did a different subset of those prescriptions, decentralization of authority and planning, and again, a demand for total integrity, that would be us. In 2007, the first time that Forbes magazine put us at number one on their list of world's most innovative companies, we have occasionally traded places between number one and number two with Tesla during the five or six years since then. In that first year, they did a backstory on how did this culture of innovation emerge. And they found that in 2006, when we were still a fairly young, rapidly growing company, we were already beginning to show the signs of turning from a cute puppy into a big smelly dog. We were beginning to have a slowing of our pace of new releases, a you know, set of quality issues. We were beginning to choke on the waste products of our own growth, as so many companies have before. And a conscious top-down decision was made to adopt the practices that are sometimes called agile management, scrum technique, whatever. Jeff Bezos at Amazon calls it the two pizza rule. That if the team that owns responsibility for a particular outcome is too big to be fed by two large pizzas, it's too big to feel personally accountable to each other. And I can show you research from military combat, professional sports, performing arts, or any other number of fields that conclusively shows People do their most extraordinary work, reach down into themselves and find things they did not know they had, not for fear of death and not for love of money, but because they will not take the risk of disappointing someone who they feel is personally relying on them. You don't take the hill because of the flag. You don't take the hill because of the bullets. You take the flag because otherwise the person on your left or the person on your right might feel that you'd let them down. And building organizations in which you do feel ownership of an outcome, do feel accountability to your team members, and all of you collectively feel a sense of co-creation with your partners is how this stuff gets done, and the, the numbers do speak for themselves. It was not a trivial process to adopt this new culture at Salesforce. There was some blood on the floor. There were some people who said, you can't build enterprise software with agile methods. No, no, no. Never been done before. That's right. It had not. And the 2,000-person company that I joined 10 years ago is now a 25,000-person company, and we have to declare a sellout on our Dreamforce conference because San Francisco can't handle anything bigger. And this is a trajectory you guys are on. You know, Greg, you're bigger than Dreamforce 1, and your growth rate year on year is, is higher. So, hey, you know, where, where's, the, where's the ceiling? I don't know where it is. And the results are, as I say, evident. This is a combination of two things, process and culture, the geeky among you will recognize that a vector dot product means you can't just multiply them, you have to align them. 
The process and the culture have to be pointing in the same direction or nothing happens. Process at right angles to culture produces a product of zero. Don't want to have that. Peter Drucker has talked about innovation in terms of certain sources of opportunity that can be found again and again and must be the object of conscious and purposeful search. It does not just happen. There are a lot of words on this slide. Let me boil it down. These are my favorite three. Incongruity, new knowledge, change in perception. Incongruity, looking at a situation and say, this doesn't make any sense. Why have we tolerated this for so long? This should be fixed. New knowledge. Well, there's a reason it looks like this. We couldn't do it any differently before, but there's this new thing here that you could actually use to do this. Change in perception. People say, cloud? No one's going to let you put important data in a place that they don't have any physical control of it. You're out of your mind. Well, we have, over the last 10 years, seen a dramatic pivot from cloud is crazy to do it yourself is dangerous. That's a 180 degree shift in point of view in a rather short period of time. And you have to not merely take these things at the flood, but drive these changes in perception if you want these things to happen. Because incongruities are my favorite place to play. Dan DeBow, when he was with us, said, you don't fall in love with your solution. If you think innovation is invention, and you think that inventing something and finding a way to sell it to people is innovative, you're mistaken. Innovation is what happens when invention achieves adoption. And adoption means that people see that and say, oh, I didn't even realize I needed that, but now you've shown that to me and I realize I really would like to have that. And what Dan said is, don't fall in love with your solution. Fall in love with the problem. So if you fall in love with the problem you're solving, then a radically new solution is a good thing. If you fall in love with your solution, then the person who comes along with a better way to do that is your enemy instead of your ally. If I've been making drill bits for years and someone figures out that you can drill holes with a water jet, I want to embrace that. And as Michael Porter at Harvard Business School famously, famously said, no one in human history has ever aspired to the ownership of a 3 8 inch drill bit. He just wanted a 3 8 inch hole. And the bit is not the product. Holes are the product. So, ask a question. When you walk into the room and say, here's what I'm here to sell you, all the defense mechanisms go up. If you go on and say, here's a problem I think we all share. Now you're inviting someone to work with you. How do we deal with the incongruity of enterprise software sucking when Amazon puts out stuff that changes all the time, that people don't take classes to learn to use, and that they embrace the change? What is that? Well, that was really what led to the formation of Salesforce, the idea that enterprise software could have these characteristics. How? Well, let's figure that out together, shall we? Then Mark asked a few years later, how many of you were on Facebook to a room full of enterprise managers? Maybe one hand besides his went up. He said, what about LinkedIn? We all raised our hands. He said, I want you all to be on Facebook. I expect to see you there. I'm there. It's the future of our business. He did not mean cat videos. He did mean self-organizing systems that figure out what you need and bring it to you proactively. Then he had a moment with a, a fellow with an outfit called Edgespring, which we subsequently acquired, who had his own road to Damascus moment. Why is it that the world's data is becoming more voluminous, more poorly structured, and has more need to be available to interaction and inspection on mobile devices when all of the traditional analytics technologies did not allow those things to happen? That was the birth of the wave engine that became our analytics cloud. And then finally, why do we treat tr customers as nothing but the sum of their transactions with us, when in many industries, the arc of a customer's experience may last for decades? That fundamental re-envisioning of marketing from let's get this sale made to let's be part of this customer's journey over whatever that period of time might be through whatever networks that might involve, that was the birth of Marketing Cloud. And you can see that these were not inventions in search of a buyer. They were questions in search of an answer. And building ecosystems that answer questions creates amazing growth and huge satisfaction for those who participate in it. We deployed Chatter within Salesforce in 2010 as a collaboration tool. And two months later, Mark was on stage in London saying that he had learned more about the secret network that ran his company in those two months than he had in the previous three years. The organization chart was not an accurate picture 
of the paths of influence and resourcefulness within the company. But now we have tools by which we can measure. In fact, I've got a number called the Chatter Influence Rank that I can look up for any of the people who report to me, and I can use that to advocate for promotions and raises. Mark went to his board and said, right now I can't promote someone above senior VP if they're an individual contributor, I'm sorry, senior director. But I need to be able to promote people two levels higher to senior VP, even if no one on paper theoretically reports to them. Because now I've got data that show that there are people whose value to this company is completely out of all proportion to what the org chart says they do. Bill Joy put this well, that most of the world's really smart people don't work for you. He thought that there were certain legacy software companies that might need to have that pointed out. And we aggressively embraced this idea with our idea exchange environment in which customers can tell us in public, this is what's not working for me. People can vote each other's ideas up and down. We quantify the priorities and people are astonished to learn our managers have to commit to retiring a certain number of idea exchange points over the course of the year if they want to get their incentive compensation. So yeah, it does come out of their wallet if they're not giving you the things that you as our co-creators have told us you want. Dell liked that idea enough that they put their own trademark on that, called it Idea Storm, and Michael Dell told Howard Schultz that it would be a great thing for Starbucks to try this. Eight weeks later, My Starbucks Ideas is a globally facing website coming up with things like the green stick that plugs the hole in the lid. That was a customer idea, and literally eight weeks from the first CEO to CEO, why don't you try this, to global deployment. And that was 10 years ago. So just imagine how quickly we could do that now. It would be malpractice for, you to, for me to get you excited about the idea that you can do this and not give you some pretty specific ideas about getting it done. Pick the behaviors. Many organizations just aren't prepared to acknowledge that the behavior they say they want is not the behavior that they reward. We hire people away all the time from other companies who come in the door saying, the CEO is out there saying that we're totally committed to doing X, but they still pay us to do Y. If your compensation model tells people one thing while your CEO is saying another, guess which one wins? Getting it done means picking the behaviors you want, connecting them to a purpose. If you tell people why you want it done, you really don't have to try that hard to get them to do it, as opposed to just trying to do it as a command thing. Test, test, test. Theodore von Karman at MIT once said, if a test never fails, you weren't testing, you were demonstrating. If it never fails, you weren't testing. If it never fails, what are you learning? How are you going to learn? And then reward and recognize and educate and socialize the behavior because as I've indicated, people do their most amazing work because someone that they cared about depended on them to do it. And that's what I wanted to share with you today. Starts with the behaviors, show people the purpose, don't expect it to be obvious, do look for results, and plan to learn from mistakes. Thank you for letting me be with you today.